Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. When I searched the web for how-to books recently, I came up with 6.5 million hits, from How to Train Your Dragon to the iconic Dale Carnegie work, How to Win Friends and Influence People. With us is Derek Lido, a Princeton University professor who's written a fascinating book entitled Startup Leadership. It is the best book I have seen on how to start your own company and make it successful. Derek was the founder and CEO of iSupply, a major technology information company, which he sold to IHS in 2010 for over $100 million. At Princeton, he teaches a course in entrepreneurial leadership. Derek, we're delighted to have you with us. Jim, it's a real pleasure. Now, I'm always fascinated by titles. You called your book Startup Leadership. How does startup leadership differ from other kinds of leadership? Well, startup leadership is probably the most difficult form of leadership there is. And why do you say that? Because you start with no constituency. You, you have to, nobody cares if you're going to be successful. It's and all so about you. It's, it starts all about you, and then you have to shift gears and make it to be about everybody else. And that's a real tough balancing act. So uh, what was your purpose in writing this book? Well, I, I noted that um, more people failed as entrepreneurs after they had started the company than before. So it was a lot easier to be an entrepreneur than it was to be a successful entrepreneur, and something needed to be done about that. And so nobody else was doing something, and I did. I guess anyone can say they're an entrepreneur, but to be successful, that's, that's the holy grail. Unfortunately, it only happens to really about one in 50 entrepreneurs. You say that entrepreneurial leadership or startup leadership is the hardest form of leadership. Why do you say that? Well, because... No, nobody really cares whether or not you're going to be successful there at the beginning. So you're starting to build up one by one people that are going to help you be successful. There's not a lot that you can do on your own. You need to develop uh, hundreds if not thousands of people that ultimately change their lives and become passionate about making your vision uh, come true. Now these people would be the, the whole cluster of uh, individuals or companies having a relationship with the startup, uh, funders, uh, people within the organization, customers and, and the like, isn't that right? Total 360 and uh, so your employees and customers, hey also the, the people back home that uh, care and love you, they need to, uh, they're playing a big role in this as well. Now, of course, the uh, paradigm startup, the greatest success story in mm -hmm. American history, I mean, maybe it's Facebook, but mm -hmm. it's probably Google, and it's uh, Sergey Brin and, mm -hmm. uh, and Larry Page. Mm -hmm. And recently, uh, just a few months ago, they announced that they were putting Google under the umbrella of a new company called Alphabet. Uh, is that a startup? Or is a startup something else? They have a lot of customers and a lot of employees, so I don't call them a startup And they don't anymore. have to worry about funding. And they don't have to worry about funding. They have to worry about big bank balances. <laughs> and so that, that's a different set of challenges that they face. So you're talking about a startup from scratch. Now, you have students at Princeton. Uh, do you find that a lot of them uh, prefer a startup environment where they tried to execute an idea in a garage uh, to going out and uh, working for, uh, for IBM or somebody else? But more and more. Uh, so this is a very significant uh, interest area among the undergraduates. Uh, there's an annual uh, pitch contest. So for people with what ideas. What happens at a pitch contest? Well, they come and they uh, sort of propose an idea in front of a set of judges. And, uh, and who are the judges? Uh, I'm a lawyer. Should... I always ask, who's the judge? Uh, who's the judge? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, successful entrepreneurs, professors, and venture capitalists usually. 
And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, 500 students, that's like 10% uh, of the entire student body, will be out there pitching uh, on any given year. So that's a lot of interest. Are these real pitches or is it just for practice? It's mostly for practice. Uh, although a, a fairly significant number of uh, undergraduates go on to start companies either upon graduation or shortly thereafter. Now is uh, the pitch confined to the idea that they just get up there and say I have an idea for an app where you can put anything mm -hmm. you want on the internet and then delete it immediately <laughs> or uh, do they have to tell how they plan to fund the idea and execute the idea and uh, organize the idea. So, so th there are uh, speed pitch contests where it's just the headline idea, but uh, the big contest on campus, they actually have to submit be business plans and show that this is an idea that can work. But I'd like to add, though, that it's, uh, particularly on Princeton's campus, it's far more than this app stuff. So almost half of the ideas are social enterprises where the, the, it's not as much about profits as it is about delivering social good. So there's uh, incentive for people of you know, all different thought processes to, um, to be entrepreneurs here. So your entire template for startup leadership might apply to uh, not-for-profits and social investment as well as to uh, for-profits where uh, uh, the undergraduate goes out and uh, makes a billion dollars. Exactly. It's about enterprises, however they define the value they're going to create. What is the uh, temperature of uh, undergraduates uh, today? Do you find that many of them are interested in social investment and, uh, and philanthropy, or do you find they all want to go out there and, uh, and make a fortune? Uh, I, I find actually that it's the social good that um, tops the list in terms of their personal ambitions and that they feel that uh, living a life just making money is uh, not a life that uh, is going to give them what they're looking for. What kinds of, uh, of social investment are undergraduates interested in now? We, we had a um, uh, startup. I, uh, the, where two young ladies, they graduated and they went to Kenya to start a job marketplace because uh, employment's hard, it's hard to match employers with people with the right skills and they used the basic SMS text messaging and uh, bingo, they created a, a successful company. Uh, down in Kenya doing that and helping tens of thousands of people find uh, better jobs than they could have otherwise. So that's a, that's a prime example of the, the, the sorts of social enterprises the Princeton students are thinking about starting. So they'd have to, they have to get it funded, so they prepare grant proposals, say for foundations, and have to form relationships uh, uh, with uh, the leaders of, uh, of foundations in order to fund the project, isn't that right? Well, so, so sometimes uh, that, that particular startup, Duma, uh, got much of their funding from winning pitch contests, <laughs> and the prize money uh, was what uh, got them started. And then, as many good entrepreneurs find, uh, if you start your business quickly and it's profitable, then it can start funding uh, a lot of its own growth. In your book, you use the phrase hero entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What's a hero entrepreneur? I'm always fascinated with heroes. <laughs> well, the society has definitely started to look upon uh, entrepreneurs as, as heroes. Even superheroes. So even superheroes. God, they can take an idea and they can turn it into jobs for uh, you know, thousands of people and, and add countless amounts to the GDP of, the, of our nation. And um, hero entrepreneurs are, are the ones, they tend to take the riskier path. They tend to shoot high, uh, use other people's money, and if it doesn't work, they fail fast. So. Well, you've met a fair number of these people, uh, particularly uh, uh, some who've succeeded, probably mm -hmm. many have succeeded, yeah. and many who've failed. You say most of them fail. So what are the ingredients of an entrepreneurial leader who succeeds, and how do you contrast that with an entrepreneurial leader who fails? Right. So uh, that, that's been... 
uh, my life's quest is to help answer that question because uh, is, when, when I was new out of school, I, I thought that smart people would always be the ones that were most successful. And I found that that really wasn't true. The people who got uh, the most done and the like had, had uh, different sets of skills. And uh, under the, the, the big sort of label, they were able to balance a selfishness with a selflessness. So they were sort of selflessly, uh, selfishly selfless. Because how are you selfishly selfless? Oh. Or selflessly selfish? I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a critical question. So, <laughs> so when you have answer? an idea and it's really important to you, you have to be completely selfish about m doing whatever you can to make that idea successful out in the real world. You have to get people sometimes by the collar to listen to you and uh, to do it your way. That's very selfish. And if you're not in tune with that selfishness, you don't have the energy to break through to, to get your idea listened to. So what does that mean? Working 18 hour days? Working 18 hour days, but also, you know, making sure that people listen to you. And, uh, but then what happens is, so, so the selfishness is critical for being a successful entrepreneur, but leaders are people that make those around them feel they're going to be successful by following you. And that's a selfless thing. You have to put... Is it their, selflessness or the appearance of selflessness? No, it's got to be... It's got to come from within. It's got to come from within because well, people so how do you are pretty, train yourself to do that? And, and sort of the better, the larger question, how do you teach people to do that at Princeton? Well, uh, so the f most important thing is you got to break it down into requisite skills. So a skill is the ability to perform a prescribed task. And skills with a good coach and a lot of practice, you can get pretty good at. And it's a, your choice. So if we can break down entrepreneurial leadership into its requisite skills, then we can do a tremendously uh, valuable and important job in training people to get pretty good at those skills. So uh, part of that you say in your book is self-awareness. Yes. Now, how can I become self-aware of whether I'm selfish or selfless? Well, I mean, does it come from my conscience or uh, where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> so it usually comes from where, a place where you don't expect it to come from. So it usually comes from a place where it's those things that make you angry. Uh, it's those things that make you scared. It's those things that make you excited. And understanding what those are, those are the places that you're gonna find your selfishness in particular. <laughs> that, there you find your selfishness, but where do you find your selflessness? Well, where you find your selflessness is uh, ultimately realizing that you're not gonna accomplish very much yourself. You mm -hmm. can only go, this far on your own. Ah, so by selflessness, you mean exploiting others in the best sense of the word uh, to help you in your selfish pursuit. And showing them how it's in their best interest. <laughs> now, there's a goal to all this, which you call sustained value. Yeah. Now, what is sustained value? Sustain has, has become a buzzword. Everyone talks about uh, sustained economy, sustained economic yeah. activity. What do you mean by sustained value? Well, if you create an enterprise and it's going to go away the moment that you're gone, what is there? And so ultimately, you need to create an enterprise that is sustaining, self-sustaining, where the people that you've convinced <laughs> to join you will be yeah, well taken care of no matter what happens to you. Most entrepreneurs never get that far. They ultimately create organizations that fall apart without them or where the value goes away without, you know, your munificence being there. But isn't the idea to uh, have some kind of exit strategy and to exit and uh, make a bundle and then uh, spend your life in Kenya doing good? <laughs> Well, maybe for some, but ultimately, if that's your objective, then you better do it pretty fast because ultimately people around you, your customers, your investors will figure that out. And so ultimately, uh, the real value in our economy that comes so much from startups are from the startups 
that become self-sustaining. That's where the real value is. The other value of these, you know, sort of um, valuation sensations, these, you know, uh, shooting stars that uh, in three years' time you don't remember what they're called, they actually don't create very much value in our economy. So you want an enterprise, really, that's going to give you a, a livelihood and an a vocation for uh, as long as you want to pursue it, as long as you want to stay working at it. Exactly, and, and as long as all the other people that you've convinced to change their lives to follow you, that it also supports them for as long as they need it. Now, uh, what about the camel that uh, puts his nose in the tent, the venture capitalist? Mm -hmm. You write about the venture capitalist, and I don't think really in a flattering way, because <laughs> it, uh, it seems to me you need the venture capitalist if you uh, are a startup leader, an entrepreneurial leader. You need the funding. Uh, you have to get the thing off the ground, but you let the venture capitalists in, and pretty soon you're fired. Well, so I, I, I would say that that's a misinterpretation. <laughs> uh, in, in the following way. Set me straight. Way. Okay. The, wor the world and our economy benefits from uh, venture capitalists because venture capitalists are the best way to fund uh, ideas and enterprises that are um, uh, that compete based upon network effects and economies of scale. With venture capitalists, you can create an organization that can grow faster than anybody else's. So they're an essential form, and companies like Alphabet, Google, and Facebook could not have happened anywhere else in the world be other than the U.S. because of our venture capitalists. But that's a very small fraction of all the startups in the country or in the world are like that. Matter of fact, every year in the United States, there are about 700,000 new startups. And only about 1,000 of them are invested in by venture capitalists. 699,000 have to fund themselves through more traditional ways. Friends and family. Friends and family. A rich relative. Cre credit cards, <laughs> home mortgages, uh, and you know what? Profits. Profits is the real classic way that uh, venture capitalists fund themselves. So it, it, people are just a little bit um, um, oh, oh, have, overweighting. Yes, but to have profits, you have to get the product off the ground. And to get the product off the ground, you need funding. So uh, Most products, actually, can be, are profitable pretty damn quickly. In an information age. In an information age. So how do you get the word out about uh, uh, some process or some idea that, uh, uh, that you want to peddle? How do you get to your customers? Well, in the digital age, you, get, you use social media now and uh, talk about it on your, your blog or your websites. And, uh, and fortunately, that's fairly inexpensive, albeit somewhat time-consuming. Don't you need to have a basic skill set uh, before, in order to do this, to apply to uh, this model that, you're, uh, that you've designed? I mean, for example, uh, you uh, were, really were a scientist. You had a number of patents uh, before you really got into the business of semiconductors and then the business of giving information to semiconductor companies. If you look at Chipotle, mm -hmm. uh, Els, who started Chipotle, yeah. was trained as a cook. Yeah. Uh, went to cooking school. Yep. And so he was in the business. And then the idea was to apply those skills and maybe uh, uh, dial them up and, uh, and use them in the digital age in yep. some way to create a whole new uh, way of thinking about uh, restaurants and foods. Yep. So uh, isn't the skill set the place where it all has to start? Do you tell your students that? Well, uh, I tell them that uh, even in the digital age, the fundamental premise of entrepreneurship hasn't changed since the Greeks were the first entrepreneurs. It's ultimately, how are you going to make people happy? And happy enough that they're willing to give you some money in return. So that, that's the real critical question. And in the digital age, you have a few more ways of doing it than you did back in the Grecian times. But it's still the, the, the same bottom line. It's still how much, how happy are you about what I'm going to do for you? Sell the customer. It's all about the customer. 
And, uh, and, and it's not about the idea. And th that's another misconception that I have to uh, you know, really work with the students. And I love to tell a story uh, about probably the most important idea in the 20th century, which was the invention of the transistor, something that the moment it was invented, everybody understood it was going to change the world. And one of its inventors, somebody who get, got the Nobel Prize for the invention, William Shockley, so here it is, he decides he's going to dedicate his life to commercializing his invention. He's one of the smartest people on the planet. And all other smart people wanted to work with him. So he goes and he assembles a small team, and he goes, uh, sets up a company near his mother, who happened to live in Palo Alto, and that's why Silicon Valley is where it is, is because of William Shockley's mother. And and he proceeds to set back the electronics revolution by years. Because even though it's the most important idea of the you know, 20th century, he's a horrible leader. He calls his, the people stupid. He changes his mind every other week. Nothing happens. And it's the best idea ever. So an idea in a vacuum won't work. And an idea without a leader won't but work. But you still need an idea. And, and you contrast uh, Shockley with Ells. In the first place, Ells had a rich father to invest in, in mm -hmm. this new enterprise. And secondly, somehow or other, he uh, was able to scale it up, so he got McDonald's interested, and they made a, a big investment in Chipotle, which was mm -hmm. his, uh, his idea. Uh, but so some of it has to be, you, you have to have the idea to start. Is, is it a chicken and egg kind of thing? Or? You have to know how to make somebody, a lot of other people happy. So that's the, uh, that's the core of the value you're going to create. It doesn't have to be a unique idea that you're going to get a patent for, or better, a Nobel Prize. But it, so whether you're making burritos or uh, uh, many other forms of consumer products that don't have a lot of patent coverage, it's all about how happy, how excited you're making the customers. That's the real test of whether or not you have something that you can go forward with. What are the most important skills this entrepreneur must have? I take a relationship building is one of them. Yeah. Um, what are some of the others? So you, you had mentioned self-awareness because ultimately you need to understand what you bring to the party and what you're going to need other people to bring to the party. And then you need relationship building because every person that's coming to help you with your idea is somebody that you need to have a very strong and powerful relationship with. When you're dealing with larger numbers of people, you need to be able to motivate them to align their activities with you. So skills of motivation are also essential. A fourth one is leading change because as you take this idea and it takes tangible form with time, things change over and over and over again. And unless you're good at getting people feeling comfortable about changing what they're doing in their lives, then you're never going to get there. And then the, the, the fifth uh, skill is just understanding how value is created in an enterprise in the first place. Because that tells you a lot about what it is that you need to do as a leader to all these people that are dedicating their lives for you. And do you have to work in the enterprise to do that, or can you learn it at Princeton and then go out, and, out to your garage and get started? <laughs> well, I think most entrepreneurs learn it on the job. But with a little bit of uh, being forewarned, uh, your chances of success in actually practicing these skills goes way, way, way up. Uh, now, you, know, you mentioned the ancient Greeks. Uh, Plato wondered whether virtue can be taught. Uh, can entrepreneurial leadership be taught? Can startup leadership be taught? You yeah. undoubtedly think it can be. but I think so, and my students seem to feel that way too. So they've uh, almost all stayed in contact with me for years and uh, keep on feeding stories about uh, how they use this to lead successful careers and start successful companies. And what about unsuccessful companies and unsuccessful entrepreneurship? I mean, what uh, do you warn against uh, uh, various f flaws or faults in the character of the entrepreneur that's going to lead him to uh, uh, damnation? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's this tricky balance, selfishness and selflessness. Uh, and there are a lot of examples of people that have gone too far one way or the other, both go too far in either direction 
and your enterprise cannot be successful. A delicate balance. A very delicate balance. And so, but you, you have to be willing to make mistakes, don't you, if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur? You have to learn how to make mistakes. So let me ask you a question. Who's going to succeed and who's going to fail in the next 10 startups? Who's going to succeed and who's going to fail? Well, wh which 10 startups are you... you pick uh, any 10 out of a hat. Who, which entrepreneurial leaders, so-called, are going to succeed? Well, which you, ones are going to fail? A, a, an interesting test, a, easy, a fairly easy test to, to perform, is you sit down and you talk to the entrepreneur and whether or not he's open to new ideas, new whether ideas. or not he's going to learn. In other words, is he in a learning mode? And there are many entrepreneurs that start that are certain that they know everything. They're the ones that are going to fail. Well, this is so marvelous. Unfortunately, we've run out of time because oh I'd God. like to continue for a long time. This has been fabulous. So thank you, Derek. A Lito, real for pleasure. By. A and real thank pleasure. you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best and take care. And please visit our website at www.digitalage.org.